Welcome everybody to the next video in our series on probability and statistics. I am Dr. Lathram and today we will be discussing hypothesis testing. And so again before we actually get to the mathematics involved it's not a bad idea to discuss some of the philosophy behind um, the statistics. So what we really have in the background is truth. So truth is following some probability distribution. Now we may or may not know exactly what that is, but there is truth going on in the background. A lot of people may tend to think that statistics is kind of a random chaotic thing and there's really no such thing as truth, but ironically that is not true. There is truth and that is really the basis of why we are doing the experiment. We are trying to get to the truth that is in the background. And what we will do is to introduce two hypotheses. We'll introduce a null hypothesis and we'll introduce a, an alternative hypothesis as kind of filters um, between our experiment, which is happening up at the front where we're gathering data, and the values for truth that are going on in the background. And so kind of as that to look at, let's uh, delve into some of the mathematics. And so we've already talked a little bit in our philosophy about what's going on in a statistical test, but let's spell it out explicitly. So the elements of a statistical test involve a null hypothesis, which we'll usually call H0. We'll have an alternative hypothesis, H sub A. We'll have some kind of test statistic that we will be using, which will usually be a function of our data. And then we'll have a rejection region. Now the rejection region will tell us, um, we'll use that region to determine um, really which hypothesis should we reject the null hypothesis and, or not. So the test statistic again is some function of our data values. The null and the alternative hypothesis each have distinct probability distributions associated with them. And so they are distinct so that we will be able to tell them apart based on our data. The rejection region, um, we want the rejection region to be an area which is highly improbable under our null hypothesis. And so again, of course, we are conducting experiments and so we will have errors. And we'll actually have two types of errors that we'll be concerned with with our hypothesis testing. Um, the first error, a type one error, is made if the null hypothesis is rejected when the sample that we took is actually from the distribution of the null hypothesis. And so the probability of type 1 error, we usually denote that by the symbol alpha, and alpha is called the significance level. So the probability of the rejection region um, given the null hypothesis is just our significance level alpha. The second type of error that we can make is called the type 2 error. And the type 2 error is made if the null hypothesis is rejected when the sample data is actually taken from the alternative hypothesis distribution. Um, the probability of a type 2 error though we usually denote with beta and we'll talk about something called the power of the test. Now what is beta? So beta is going to be the probability um, of the complement of the rejection region um, given that we are operating under the alternative hypothesis. So that's our probability beta. Um, the power of the test, so how good the test is, um, is actually the, the um, calculated as 1 minus beta. So it's 1 minus the probability of type 2 error. Now this graph actually gives us a pretty good example maybe of what we're looking at. So we have a null hypothesis distribution and then we've got an alternative hypothesis distribution. Now we're choosing the type 1 error, um, so our significance level, so that that's the probability of um, 
having some value in the null hypothesis be really, really extreme. So it's really going to be out there. It's really not likely under the null hypothesis. So that's indicated by this kind of pink, red, orange area that we see here. Um, so what we really have here, and the important thing to remember, is that um, it is not going to be impossible for a value to land in the rejection region under the null hypothesis. It is just really, really unlikely, or we want it to be really, really unlikely. Unlikely, not impossible. In fact, um, unlikely really means we're not going to see it very much, but in fact, it will absolutely positively happen. And that's kind of the key to um, really understanding a lot of the statistics that we're talking about. Um, now, conversely, we want the complement of the rejection region to have um, a small probability also under the alternative hypothesis. Um, so what that would mean is that it would be really likely um, for us to be under the alternative hypothesis and be outside the rejection region. And so we would think we would be right in accepting or in um, failing to reject the null hypothesis when in fact we were really alter um, um, operating under the alternative hypothesis. And so we really want um, beta to be a small value as well. And so, of course, one of the super major players anytime that you're talking about statistics is the central limit theorem. So let's recall what the central limit theorem says. And then if we've got a bunch of random variables, y1, y2, all the way up to yn, and they are independent, identically distributed random variables, we know that each one of them has an expected value of mu, and each one of them has a variance of sigma squared, and that variance is finite, then we can take the average of those, and if we take the average of those values, subtract mu, and divide by sigma over root n, then this new random variable u sub n, as n goes off to infinity, the distribution for u sub n approaches the distribution for standard normal. And so that's going to be kind of one of our key players, and it's always one of our key players. Um, what we will do in pretty much everything that we're going to be assuming is that we've got a large enough sample that we are justified in assuming that u sub n, um, that the distribution for u sub n, it pretty well is approximated by standard normal. So um, in a lot of areas, in some statistics classes, that may actually be the first assumption that people make when they just start discussing statistics is that let's just assume that we have a normal distribution. Well, we really can't assume that we've got a normal distribution. What we might be able to assume um, is that uh, we have enough data that the distribution of the means of our data um, is normally distributed. And so that's probably a more proper way to say it um, rather than just let's begin by assuming that everything is normally distributed. That, as we have seen in our previous videos, is totally not true. And so the setup for our problems is going to be this. We have random variables, y1, y2, up to y sub n. They are an independent, identically distributed sample. They have, each variable has a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared. So the first question, always the first question that we should ask ourselves when we're gathering data is, does the sample size warrant actually warrant invoking the central limit theorem? And that's going to be one of our major questions. Um, 
in fact, um, it kind of leads to an entirely different set of questions and entirely different things that we can look at that fall under the realm of normality testing. So it is something actually from a normal distribution. And for those kind of things, we've got um, tests like Anderson Darling, um, Kamelgarov Smirnoff, the Shapiro Wilk. Um, we're not going to worry about any of those in anything that we're going to be doing. That's probably a, another video much later. And so now we're going to, uh, for our answer to question one, we're going to punt and say that, uh, well, we'll assume that our distribution is sufficiently large that uh, we can invoke the central limit theorem. So the second question is, do we know the value of sigma? Well, if we did, remember that kind of going back to our um, confidence interval video, that if we know sigma, then we can use the Z statistic where we've got Y bar minus mu over sigma over root n. Um, more than likely in the real world, we do not know what sigma is. And so in that case, um, we'll turn it over to the T statistic where we are going to take, instead of the standard deviation, we'll take the um, sample standard deviation, so the square root of the sample variance instead. And so let's discuss a t-test. So what is a t-test? Well, we're starting with our setup. So we've got n independent identically distributed random variables um, from an approximately normal distribution. Um, our, our, our normal, uh, from a normal distribution, our um, Null hypothesis is that we've got some value for the mean. So we've got some value mu naught in mind. Now for the alternative hypothesis, we can actually have um, three different questions. We can have an upper tailed alternative in which we assume that um, the true value um, is going to be greater than mu naught. We can have a lower tail alternative in which we assume that um, the true value of mu is less than mu naught, or we can just take a two tailed alternative in which case we assume that the value of true value of mu is just not mu naught at all. And so, what statistic we're going to do, you'll use. Um, since sigma is not known, we will use the t test. So we know that y bar minus mu naught over s over root n. So this is the test statistic under the null hypothesis that it has a t distribution with um, n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And so what we have, we can find um, for our rejection regions values where t is greater than t of 1 minus alpha. Um, for a lower tail alternative where t is going to be less than t sub alpha and for a two-tailed rejection region where the absolute value of t is going to be greater than t sub 1 minus alpha over 2 and again you'll recognize that 1 minus alpha over 2 um, coming from the uh, we want half of our error above and half of our error below. Now before we get to a super popular version of the t-test, um, let's recall a couple of facts. So if we've got a bunch of independent random variables, x sub j's and y sub k's, and they are all independent from one another, we're taking, we're assuming that the x sub j's are an ID sample from a normal distribution with um, mean mu sub 1 and variance sigma sub 1 squared and the y sub k's are an IED sample from a normal distribution with a mean mu sub 2 and a variance sigma sub 2 squared. Then we know that x bar minus y bar also is normally distributed with a mean of mu 1 minus mu 2 and a variance of sigma 1 squared over n squared plus sigma 2 squared over m squared.
Now, also, another fact that we'll need is that we've got a bunch of random variables, and they are distributed chi-squared with nu sub i degrees of freedom. They are independent. Then, if we add all of those together, we still get a chi-squared distribution with the number of degrees of freedom being the sum of the degrees for each of the x sub i's. And so, kind of recalling those two formulas, Let's see what we have. If we assume that sigma sub one and sigma sub two are equal, so we're going to take, make that assumption, then we know that x bar minus y bar minus the difference of mu sub x and mu sub y over sigma times the square root of one over n squared plus one over m squared, that's gonna be distributed normally, um, actually distributed standard normally. Um, since the sample variances um, scale properly are chi-squared, we can add those together and obtain a chi-squared distribution with n plus m minus 2 degrees of freedom. And so if we put those together with our definition of what a t-value was, so a t-value we needed a variable that was distributed standard normally. We needed a second variable that would be distributed with a chi-squared with new degrees of freedom. Then if we did the first variable divided by the square root of the second variable, divided by the um, number of degrees of freedom, then that gave us a t distribution. And so in fact, if we simplify, plug those values in, simplify them a little bit, we get an expression of this form where we have assumed that s squared is going to be n minus one s sub x squared. So the sample variance for the x's plus m minus one times the sample variance for the y's and all of those divided by n plus m minus two. So I invite you to uh, maybe go through that algebra yourself, convince yourself that that's actually going to come out right. And uh, now we're ready to go on to a really popular version of the t-tests. So in this version of the t-test, we are actually testing um, two separate groups. So we've got an x group and we've got a y group. And those are both um, distributed normally each with mu's and our uh, mu sub x for the x's, mu sub y for the y's, and we are assuming that the variances are also equal. So that's going to be going to be an important component of this particular part of the test is that the sample variances or the sample standard deviations are, um, or that the true variations um, variances for each group are going to be equal. So we need sigma to be the same in both cases. So what we're going to be testing is the null hypothesis that um, the means are actually the same, that mu sub x is equal to mu sub y. And again, we've got three possible alternatives. We could have mu sub x greater than mu sub y, mu sub x less than mu sub y, or just mu sub x not equal to mu sub y. So again, we'll use the test statistic, and based on the data that we just um, derived above, our test statistic t will have this form to it. And... Um, We'll have, again, the same kind of rejection regions. So for the upper tail, t is greater than t of 1 minus alpha. Lower tail, t is less than t sub alpha. And for the two-tailed test, um, the absolute value of t is greater than t of 1 minus alpha over 2. And so kind of this situation, we might say that suppose we're testing um, a new drug or um, in a treatment and so we would have one set of um, people so those would be the x values taking the old drug another set the um, new people taking the new drug those are the y's and we want to see if the new drug is performing better than the old drug so we'll measure our values um, assume that they're normally distributed with the same variance and uh, and then run our test to see whether um, the two means are actually the same. So that's kind of a real popular version of, um, of the t-test. And so one thing that we've kind of been 
batting around in all of this is the significance level alpha. And so sometimes what you'll see represented is not necessarily alpha, but something called a p-value. Now really what is the p-value? The p-value is called the attain significance level. So basically it's defined as if W is a test statistic and the, the uh, p-value, so the attained significance level, is the smallest level of significance alpha for which the observed data indicates that the null hypothesis should be rejected. So the p-value is actually the probability of the rejection region determined by our value W. So W, little w, is what we get when we actually perform the experiment um, the p-value is the probability of that under the null hypothesis. Now, um, the level of type 1 error, again, why would people report this? Um, the type 1 error that was chosen kind of completely arbitrary. One person may choose a significance level of 0.05. Another person may be more demanding and want a significance level of 0.01. And so, because of that, um, what we would typically report is the p-value based on the experiment. So the p-value would actually then be available for both people um, to say, well, how close were you to the boundary? I might have rejected it. You might not have. Um, reporting the p-value lets them kind of decide for themselves on um, how valid the experiment was or how statistically significant the experiment was. Um, basically, the general rule of thumb is the lower the p-value, the stronger the evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And so, as we're running through things, um, we'll really want small p-values. Uh, but being the very, very uh, perceptive viewer that you are, I'm sure that at this point you're saying, but what about type 2 error? Well, that is an excellent question, and I'm really glad you asked that. So remember that uh, we define the type 2 error as the probability of the complement of the rejection region under the alternative hypothesis. That was our type 2 error beta. And that the power of the test was defined as 1 minus beta. Now the real, real problem with this is how we actually come up with the distribution under the alternative hypothesis. So we can't necessarily say that it's going to be Gaussian because we've got lots of different betas that remember we're taking the complement of a rejection region and so lots of different values. We could say that um, our mean is just greater than mu naught. That's a lot of value. So how do we come up with a distribution that actually compensates for all of those values? That's kind of a difficult thing to do. And so the solution to that is actually um, also has bearing on our sample size that um, since we are assuming that under H naught that theta is a particular value, theta sub naught, or mu is a particular value, mu sub naught, um, we might actually have some other value in mind. So we could have some other value in mind that it might be, or um, probably as more often is the case, we might have a desired minimum separation between the values um, of the null hypothesis and maybe the minimum or maximum value of the alternative hypothesis that we want. We want some minimum separation um, between those means. And so we can use that to come up with a sample size. So if we assume that we have some value theta sub a for the alternative hypothesis, so that the z um, score for that is theta hat minus theta sub a over sigma over root n, that's distributed standard normally. We have a rejection region, say, let's just take in this case um, that we want to reject for theta hat greater than some value k. Well, if we plug that in, 
then our probability beta is going to be the probability of the rejection, complement of the rejection region under the alternative hypothesis. Well, that's theta hat is going to be less than k under the alternative hypothesis, which means that we have theta hat minus theta sub a, or sigma over root n, is going to be smaller than this expression under the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so that means the z value is smaller than z sub beta. And so what do we do? We, um, we set z sub beta equal to k minus theta sub alpha over sigma over root n. Um, now coming back to the null hypothesis for our rejection region, we want alpha to be theta hat minus theta naught over sigma over root n, and that's going to be greater than z sub 1 minus alpha. And so kind of putting these together, um, we can see that for a value for k is going to be sigma over root n times z sub 1 minus alpha plus theta naught. So putting this stuff together, we see that um, solving for root n, that we get root n is, being, is going to be sigma times z sub beta minus z sub 1 minus alpha over theta naught minus um, theta sub alpha. Squaring everything, then we get an expression that looks like this. And so for our kind of minimum desired separation of theta naught and theta sub alpha, um, we can figure out what our sample size is going to be. Now, another interpretation of the expression we just came up with that's probably a little more applicable um, is if we have just a fixed value of n, then we can rearrange that formula and see that we have an expression that looks like this. Now, the absolute value of theta sub naught minus theta sub alpha is going to be equal to sigma times the absolute value of z sub beta minus z sub 1 minus alpha over root n. So how might we interpret that? It could be a measure of how fine-grained our test actually is going to be. So how big a separation can we actually determine with our sample sizes for a particular, if we wish our um, test to have a particular um, power? And um, so that's, that's kind of an interesting take on things. And so now um, we've kind of gone through those. And of course, with this, what we've just done in determining the sample size. And so now that we've kind of gone through all of the mathematics, it's probably a good time to head over to R and um, see what all of this actually looks like when we start putting the rubber to the road. So let's head over and take a look there.